All right. So as we noted uh, last week, we are have moved on from Smyrna on to Pergamos in this. Uh, it's interesting how that the, the way in which Jesus addresses these churches, it's all in a pattern going from the island of Patmos, which is where the revelation to John was given. John wrote it down, and then it was delivered to Ephesus, then up to Smyrna, and then 40 miles north, 15 miles to the northwest, or northeast rather, to Pergamon. This is the road that went up from Smyrna. Smyrna went straight north up 40 miles and then 15 miles to the northeast to Pergamon. So about 55 mile journey uh, to Smyrna. And as we noted, the, the geography of this city is such that there was this kind of a uh, very hilly terrain. One in particular uh, hill that was pretty steep on all three sides, save for southern side, uh, which is the path up. And that's where all of the altars and all of the temples to the Greek gods were. And this is the kind of a recreation of the Acropolis, uh, the downtown area of Pergamos. Uh, and so all of this was uh, stuff that they uh, uh, kind of had there, some of the, the imagery that uh, some of the ruins suggest existed there in Pergamos. This is another recreation of it as well. Uh, this is, and we talked about this, is the steepest theater in Asia Minor. It seats about 10,000 people, but by far the steepest. It was uh, the original theater from the building of the city around 200 B.C. or so. And then, uh, as we talked about, Pergamon initially was the capital city of the kingdom of Pergamon, also known as the Italid Kingdom. Uh, but Pergamon was the capital of this entire kingdom up until about 131 B.C., when its dying king, or 133 B.C., its dying king gave it to Rome. It was never conquered. It was simply given because the, the king had no heirs. He wanted to make sure his kingdom was taken care of. He gave it to the kingdom of Rome, uh, and so it was inherited basically by the Roman Empire. And then from that point on, it was the Roman capital of Asia Minor until 130 A.D., so about 30 years even after Jesus addresses these churches, uh, for 30 years past that, Pergamon or Pergamos remained the capital city of Asia Minor. Uh, and it had this air of being a capital city. Uh, it had great history attached to it. Even Pliny, the Roman historian, called it the most famous city of Asia. Uh, we talked about how the term parchment actually comes from the phrase, uh, the Pergamos or the Pergamon uh, chart or the Pergamon sheet. Uh, and there's a whole history there with uh, the king of, of Pergamon and the king of Egypt and the, their libraries. They had a very famous library, world famous library. Uh, and as we talked about, it's the, it's the, it was the center of, or a center, great center of idol worship. Of course, Jesus even references that a bit in his address to these brethren. But it, for one of the, the key components was it was a center of the Asclepios cult. Asclepios is, uh, was the god of healing. He was referred to as Asclepios Soter, which is Asclepios the Savior. Uh, his symbol was that of the snake, and the snake was considered the incarnation of Asclepios himself. A lot of us are familiar with, sometimes, we, we, if we're, especially if we're not familiar with the medical symbol versus the commerce symbol, this is the caduceus. It looks similar to the, the medical symbol which we've talked about, the rod of Asclepius. They're not the same, however. But the rod of Asclepius, which is the medical symbol throughout our society, it comes from the, uh, the Asclepius, from that, that Greek god Asclepius, which I think is kind of interesting. Now, we talked about that one hill. It's a large conical hill, uh, pretty steep on all three sides with a mesa, a plateau at the top. And this is where all of their uh, shrines and altars to the Greek gods were. And it kind of held this imagery of Mount Olympus. In fact, many people, because Mount Olympus was a mythical place, it never existed. But because it held that imagery, many of the Greek worshipers would travel to Pergamos as a pilgrimage, and they would, they would approach the city. In fact, uh, yeah, they would approach. This is the road coming into Pergamos, and as they would approach, they would see, and now this is, this is 2,000 years after the case, remember, so, well, 1,900 years. So a lot of this has been filled in, but 1,900 years ago, this was much steeper on all three sides, save for the southern side, which is the road up to kind of like a pilgrimage up to 
Mount Olympus is the imagery there. So uh, those who would do this pilgrimage, they would see Mount Olympus as they approached uh, Pergamos. Uh, this is what I assume is a recreation. The, 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 uh, the tag on it said it's the altar of uh, uh, Zeus that was at Pergamon, but I'm assuming it's a recreation. But anyway, this is at a, at a uh, 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 museum in Berlin uh, that has recreated this, what this altar of Zeus looked like in Pergamos. And then it was also a major center of Caesar worship, what's known as the imperial cult. There were two main aspects of the imperial cult. There was Dea Roma or Dea Romana, which is the spirit of Rome. It was embodied in a goddess. So Rome kind of was embodied by a goddess that they made up. Uh, but also, August, starting with Tiberius Caesar, there was a, a cult to Caesar, a worship of Caesar. Very similar to how uh, the Egyptians would worship certain pharaohs because they were considered God on earth. Okay, they were considered the closest thing to God on earth that they could get. And as soon as they died, they would ascend and become a god. Uh, and so just as the Egyptians had pharaoh worship, so also did the Romans have Caesar worship. Uh, and again, that started with Tiberius. But there's a, a particular title that was given to many of the cities of Asia. Uh, there were called, they were called temple sweepers, neokoros. They were the temple sweepers. Basically, it was supposed to be a, a humble... Uh, a servant type of title to represent that we take care of the temple of this god or of that god. Now, that didn't mean that there was, that was the only temple of Caesar or, or in Ephesus. They were the temple sweepers for Diana. But it didn't mean there weren't other temples of Diana. It just meant that that city and those people were dedicated to the service to particularly Diana. Well, in Pergamos, they were given to the service of Caesar. And it was a rare title that was given only to uh, many of the most, uh, I guess you could say, the most religious of individuals and cities uh, that were there. Uh, in, at its peak, around the 150s, this is about 20 years after it ceased being the capital city of Asia Minor, uh, was, was its peak. After this, it went downhill. Uh, but about 200,000 people in the 150s AD, and remember, this is about a five square mile, six square mile area in which these people lived. So it was very packed people, our packed place. Had a proud history, had academic pride, had status as the capital of Asia, and it had the arrogance of idolatry, especially represent, representing kind of Mount Olympus itself uh, in all of its forms. And so this is kind of the backdrop of what Jesus writes to these brethren uh, when he starts here in Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 12. So when he writes to this church in Pergamos, now remember we talked before about Smyrna and a lot of the dangers that the brethren faced in Smyrna, especially when it came time to offer their yearly homage to Caesar. All of the, the Roman citizens were required at once a year to receive their certificate stating that they had offered their, it would, they would take a pinch of incense, they would throw it on the altar to Caesar, and then they would say, Caesar is Lord. Okay, that's what they were required to do. And it really wasn't about religious loyalty. It was really more geared towards civil loyalty. Because ultimately, the Roman Empire didn't pay too much attention if you weren't religious in your offerings to Caesar and things like that. It was more of a civil loyalty. But as we talked about the church in Smyrna, they would refuse to offer that incense. They would refuse to say Caesar is Lord, and that caused great problems. Uh, well, here, the church of Pergamon, they would have been, all of these churches would have faced this in all of these cities. Some, were, some cities were a bit more nitpicky, I guess you could say, about it, or more, uh, they paid more attention to it. Smyrna, we talked about Smyrna and how it was a center of the imperial cult. Well, Pergamos was as well. Uh, and whether or not, I haven't read anything if they were quite as... Uh, focused as Smyrna was on rooting out anyone who didn't pay homage to Caesar, but I imagine they probably weren't far off if they, if they weren't. Uh, but here in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 12, Jesus says to the church, or the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now there's a couple of places in the New Testament where the phrase two-edged sword is referenced. Uh, but it's interesting that, remember we talked about with all of these churches of Asia, every one of them, the address goes back to something from Revelation 1, when Jesus is kind of introduced in this vision 
in this revelation to John in Revelation 1. Well, here it goes from chapter 1 to verse 16. This is the reference that Jesus is utilizing. So we find in verse 15, John says, as he's been kind of receiving this vision, his feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Now, as I mentioned, all of these addresses from, the, from Jesus to these churches, they all borrow from this imagery of Revelation 1, but they also have an express purpose. There's a reason why Jesus says what he says to these churches. With Ephesus, he says, I hold the seven stars and I walk in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. And as we're told at the end of Revelation 1, these represent the churches. Okay, Jesus, when that term hold means to completely in, in, in cap kind of encompass with your hand. You don't just, I can't hold this the way Jesus is referring to. I can take hold of it, but Jesus is referring to completely grasping around of it. It's the sense of ownership, of complete authority over. And that's part of verse 16 is he has in his right hand the seven stars. Okay, he owns them. They are his churches. Well, the church at Ephesus, the danger was they were, he was going to let loose one of those. You, your candlestick will be taken away because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And with here, with Pergamos, there's a similar situation that Jesus is, calling, is going to call on them to repent. And so I think it's interesting that Jesus uses, though, the second phrase of verse 16, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. It still carries with it the full representation of how Jesus is being shown here in verse 16, that, that these churches belong to me, they are mine, and I have control. I'm the head of these churches. Of course, Jesus knows all things that are taking place. He knows everything that's going on. But as he says in verse 15, I'm sorry, verse 12, he says, this is he who says, or this, these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now, there's two main terms in the New Testament for sword. One term, which is uh, makaira, uh, you see this in passages like Hebrews, or Ephesians 6, verse 17, Hebrews 4, verse 12, which might be one of the first places we think about when we talk about the two-edged sword, how that the word of God is like a two-edged sword capable of discerning joints and marrow and, and the thoughts and intents of the heart and so forth. But the Hebrew writer there uses the term makaira, which is a very surgical precision type of instrument, type of sword. The term Jesus uses is the romphia. This carries with it the sense of power, of judgment. Uh, a lot of times the romphia was used more almost as a symbolic sword rather than a functional sword. Uh, it was used to show ma not only majesty, but the authority behind the power of the throne. Uh, and this is the term that Jesus uses. This, he has the sharp two-edged sword. This isn't just a precision instrument and using in a discerning way as the Hebrew writer uses the word of God, but in the sense of the sword that comes out of his mouth. And of course, what's the imagery there? A sword coming out of his mouth. What do you think the sword represents? Huh? Well, the tongue, but, but what comes from the tongue? The word. Yeah, it's, it's the word of God. Okay, the word of Jesus. And so this sharp two-edged sword, this is Jesus' word that carries this power, that carries this judgment. And it's that imagery that he's presenting to the church at Pergamos. Remember we talked about the difference between Pergamos and Pergamon, just in case anybody's confused. Uh, there's an old, 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 I think the old King James uses Pergamum. But Pergamos is the, the newer Greek translation of the name of the city. It's just an updated version of the name, as opposed to Perga, Pergamon or Pergamum, which is kind of the older style of translation of, of the Greek. It's the same thing, same place. Uh, and so since the New King James translates it Pergamos, that's the, that's the one I'm going to use. Uh, but there's a reason why Jesus is using that imagery. Okay, the word that Jesus speaks there's a reason why that word has power and judgment, and it's in connection with Jesus possessing those churches. These are mine. I have the power over them. I am in control of them. Any thoughts through verse 12? 
He goes on to say in verse 13, he says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Now, with all of the churches, whether good or bad, he always uses the phrase, I know your works. And to me, that always carries with it that sense of the fact, like Jesus walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. He knows everything that's taking place, whether good or bad. Some of these churches, there is no good to be said about them. But still, Jesus knows their works. He knows everything that's taking place. Nothing escapes his attention. But he says, I I know where you dwell. Now, this is a really interesting term, dwell, because usually in the New Testament, regardless of when it's being referenced, where Christians dwell, there's a term that is used to describe one who sojourns. Even where a a person lives, that person is sojourning there. And it's that imagery that they're a pilgrim here. Even though in the flesh they're dwelling in this city or that city, that the sense of it is that they're simply pilgrims. They're sojourning. But this term, Jesus uses it specifically that represents this is your permanent residence. And it's really kind of interesting because it's as if Jesus is acknowledging, I know you don't have a choice. You're stuck there. Okay, we talked before about some of these terrible places in which these people live, like Smyrna, and how that, you know, why, why wouldn't they just leave? Why wouldn't they run away? And some of them may have. But keep in mind, especially like the church at Smyrna, Jesus referred to their poverty, and the term poverty with regard to Smyrna was complete destitution. They had nothing. And in order to travel, in order to move or do anything, not only did you have to have a place to go and a job to be able to work when you went there, but you had to have money to get there in the first place. And a lot of these people didn't have the means to go anywhere, much less the fact that many of these people, keep in mind, for us, moving cities for a different job, that sort of thing happens quite a bit. For them, a lot of these people would be born in that city, they would die in that city, and unless they had the money, very rarely would they ever visit any other cities. Okay, this was kind of their life. This is the, the span of their entire world was the city limits. And so for most of them, they were stuck there. They couldn't leave. And when Jesus says, I know where you dwell, I, I know where your residence is, and you're stuck there. And Jesus is acknowledging that. He says, where Satan's throne is. Some translations have Satan's seat, which I think is a little unfortunate because you lose a little bit of the, em- the emphasis here. The term is thronos. It's literally the place of power, okay, the place of authority. Now, that's not to say that Rome wasn't also a, a place of Satan's throne. Okay? It's not that this was literally where he lives or dwells in that sense, but it's a place, it's a center of that which is from the devil. Now, what's the first thing that might come to your mind based on some of the background we just noticed as to why Jesus might say, this is where Satan's throne is? Idol worship. worship. Yeah. And the, the, just the, I guess you could say, how saturated that society would have been in idol worship, not only for the people who lived there, but also for all of the, pilgrim, the, the pilgrims who would pilgrimage to Pergamos just to kind of feel that, that holiness or whatever they might attribute it to of being close to this imagery of Mount Olympus, to be able to offer this, this offering on the altar of Zeus. You know, this, this type of imagery and how prevalent, how saturated it was in their community was certainly a, I think, certainly a part of why Jesus references where Satan's throne is. Uh, not that that was the singular place. Anywhere there's sin, that's, that's part of Satan's influence. But this is a, a major place in Asia Minor, which I think is kind of interesting. Is there anywhere else in the New Testament where Pergamos is mentioned? No. No. Uh, in fact, many of these cities that Jesus writes to, we do have reference to Ephesus, obviously, Thyatira, who was, who, who, who was famously from Thyatira? Lydia, yeah, Lydia, the seller of purple was from Thyatira. Uh, so there's a couple others that, that are mentioned elsewhere, like in the book of Acts, but the city of Pergamos isn't. Now, I know Paul probably at some point as he was going through Asia Minor or on his journeys, he had to have gone through there. 
Okay, in fact, Pergamos is right there on that, that edge of the region known as Galatia. Remember, the letter to the Galatians was not written to a singular church. It was written to a region. And Pergamos was kind of that gateway between Galatia and that other part of Asia Minor. They're on the tip, and I forget the name of that one. Uh, but So you know Paul had to go through Pergamos. And, and yet, we're given glimpses of some of the places where he went and what he did and what he taught. And I can only imagine, I would love to know what all happened when Paul went to Pergamos, how the church was established, or for that matter, Smyrna, you know, in such a, such a place with, with such a society that looked down on the poor, that viewed the poor as worse than dirt. That's how they would have viewed the Christians who were destitute, you know, and yet these churches, not only did they exist there, they thrived in their faith. I won't say they thrived in number because I don't know but they thrived in their faith. Their faith was tested beyond measure, and they were faithful. Remember, Antipas, well, his, uh, the Lord, the Jesus' faithful martyr, was killed in Pergamos. Okay, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, so this is a place of, of great persecution, great trouble, and these brethren remained faithful despite it. And he goes on to say, so anything through where Satan's throne is here? All right, he goes, Jesus goes on to say, And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. It's interesting to me that Jesus twice references the fact that this is where Satan dwells. First he references Satan's throne, then he references where Satan dwells. Now, again, we talk about idolatry, and I think from a broad application, I think that's absolutely true, that, that, that the fact that Jesus is referencing Satan's dwelling, his throne is in Pergamos, has to do with idolatry. It's possible, however, there's even more specific aspects to this. Remember, Asclepios, who was supposed to be the god of healing, okay, now that was physical healing, but what kind of healing does Jesus offer? Spiritual healing. Okay, spiritual healing. Not only that, but the name of Asclepios, the, to call on Asclepios, it was Asclepios uh, el Soter. Okay, the, Asclepios the Savior. But who is the real Savior? Jesus. Okay, not only that, but his symbol was what? A snake, right? And the snake is always, at least in the, in, the, in the going all the way back to Genesis, because of the event in the Garden of Eden, whose kind of symbol or representation has been and oftentimes a snake or a serpent? Yeah, Satan. Okay. And so because Satan took that, that form of a serpent or took, possessed that serpent in the garden, from that point on, a lot of times in the Bible, we reference references to serpent, especially that even the prophecy offered there in Genesis about how that you will bruise his heel, but he shall bruise your head, talking about bruising the authority of Satan, uh, that, that sense of, of that kind of carries all the way through. And the idea of Asclepios being that that was the center of Asclepios worship, that could be part of the specific that Jesus may be referencing. This literally, in a sense, was Satan's dwelling place in that Asclepios was almost symbolic of Satan in that sense. Um, we also talked about that kind of scaled replica of Mount Olympus. It also could be because they were the temple sweepers for the temple of Caesar. Okay, Ephesus certainly being the temple sweepers of the temple to Diana, that, that had a whole thing which we even read about in the book of Acts, why that was a big deal. But the fact that they were the temple sweepers, they were, they were charged with and even boasted about, which is kind of hypocritical in that this is supposed to be a humble, dutiful thing that they're doing for Caesar, the, the god of Caesar, and yet they're boasting about it. Uh, yet that, that could be part of it, or, or, and, and more likely it's all of that put together. I mean, can you imagine a society where it's not just a Sclepios, and it's not just the scaled replica of Mount Olympus, but also the fact that they're the temple sweepers for Caesar. I mean, you put all of that together, and it's no wonder Jesus refers to this place as the place where Satan dwells, the, the throne of Satan. All right, anything through that aspect of it? Because Jesus references, you did not deny my faith, even in the days in which... 
Uh, now, this particular uh, situation, we don't have in the New Testament regarding what happened to Antipas specifically. Now, according to legend, he was roasted alive within a bronze bull. Okay, now, that's according to legend. We don't know that that's exactly what happened, but that certainly wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility given many of the idolatrous things we see happening, especially in the Old Testament. Burning people alive in a bronze bull was something that was done among the, uh, the false gods, the idols of the peoples of, of Canaan. Uh, so it's not entirely unlikely that that may not, I mean, obviously Antipas was killed for the cause of Christ. How he was killed, the Bible doesn't say, so we don't know for sure, but that, at least according to legend, is how it was. Um, one interesting thing about this also is the fact that this term martyr, we have, we have an association with the term martyr as being one who dies for the cause of Christ. However, that's not actually the definition of the term in the New Testament. The term martyr is one who is a witness. The interesting thing about it is that one who is a witness, which is to say well, one who speaks about or speaks to the risen Jesus, maybe is a witness, and not necessarily even a witness of Jesus having been raised from the dead. I'm not saying that, that uh, Antipas wasn't, but maybe a witness of the miracles that they did in the first century. Maybe a witness to uh, you know, other aspects of the gospel. But regardless, the term martyr is one who was a witness, and the association with it to Antipas who was killed, the fact that he bore witness to the truth and he was put to death. Okay, in some form or fashion, Martis was, or, uh, Martis, uh, Antipas was willing to stand up for the truth of God's word. He was to bear witness to the truth in whatever way it was that he did, and he was killed as a result. That's part of the reason why the term martyr has taken on this sense of one who stands up for what they believe and are killed for it, even though the New Testament term doesn't necessarily have to imply that, it has taken on that form specifically because of Antipas. Okay, now, any thoughts or comments through that before we talk a little bit more about Antipas? Because it's interesting that this phrase that Jesus uses, my faithful martyr, okay, it's very interesting Jesus uses that phrase given what we're told in Revelation 1 verse 4, or well, verse 5, but we'll start in verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Remember, we talked about the seven spirits representing those seven churches, not those seven only, but also this idea of completion, this idea of fullness, this idea that Jesus knows everything that's going on. But then in verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, so this is not only from um, grace to you and peace from Jehovah, okay, but also from Jesus Christ, verse 5, the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, notice that John uses this phrase, the faithful witness. It's the exact same phrase Jesus uses to acknowledge Antipas. And I think that's really interesting that Jesus is referred to as the faithful witness. Here it's witness, it's translated witness, but it's the same term, martis, faithful martis. Okay, Jesus was the faithful martyr. He bore witness to the truth of God. He was put to death for it. And that same phrase is being used with regard to Antipas uh, when Jesus refers to my faithful witness. Okay, again, here it's martyr because of the translation and the association with having died for that, that faith. But it's that same phrase, faithful witness. I just think there's a, there has to be a an acknowledgement there in some form or fashion of the faith that Antipas, and, and maybe even what all Antipas had to go through, whatever it was he was put through in which he died, that certainly had some kind of an impact here. Thoughts or comments through that? Now, we're not, again, we're not given the specifics of when this situation was, but there, many of the commentaries make note that there's an aorist tense in which the term, you did not deny my faith, even in the days, verse 13. And it suggests, it indicates that there was a specific period of time where this persecution that they faced was particularly intense. 
whether it was for a couple of days, a week, a month, however long it was, there was a particular time in Pergamos, maybe there was a purging of all non uh, believers of the Greek gods or whatever, but it was before 95 AD ish because this is about when Jesus is t- giving these things to John to write. So it would have been sometime before 95 ish AD when this happened, but there was a specific time. Not to say that there wasn't other persecution they faced on a day to day basis, but like we discussed with Smyrna, there's a specific point in time where this is going to get very, very bad. Well, this already has been bad. Antipas died as a result of it. Now, whether Antipas was the only one who died, we don't know. But the very least, Antipas is the one who is mentioned, who was killed among you. And the fact that Jesus says where Satan dwells seems to suggest it had something to do with the fact that of the idolatry. Whatever that was, whatever it was that Antipas was willing to not give up, not yield to regarding the worship of idols or whatever it was, it sounds as though he was this specific persecution, or at the very least, Antipas's death, had had some kind of direct connection to the idolatry. Thoughts or comments through that? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Romans one sixteen, that gospel is transferred from being the gospel of faith to us having faith in that system of faith. Yes. So they didn't deny God's authority which brought about the dispensation of the faith. They right. clung to that. His authority versus the worldly authority of where they're at. That's a great point. You know, the the sense of the Satan's throne also has that sense of the authority in which at least people give Satan through idolatry and things like that, whether they intend to or not, it's irrelevant. That ultimately is the point. Satan had authority through these, these influences, through these means of idolatry. You contrast that with the fact that they held fast, fast to the name of Jesus. They continued to, to acknowledge themselves as Christians. What does the term Christian mean? follower of Christ, okay, or Christ-like, if you talk about the character of one, but altogether it's the follower of Christ, and they refused to yield to that, and they didn't deny his faith. Uh, and then, of course, we talk about the faith or his faith. This is a kind of a definite article type of faith, not just the persuasion and conviction of each one individual, but it's the persuasion and conviction to the word of God. The Christ and him crucified, we might say, his faith, the faith. You know, and just as, as Joe pointed out in Romans 1.17, from faith to faith, it's, you know, it's been revealed from faith to faith, from the faith of the gospel to then being created and generated within each individual as they hear it and believe it and obey it. Any other thoughts through that? All right, so then he goes on here in verse 14. So, so this, is, this is the good we have here in verse 13. Okay, this is the good. And just like with Smyrna and just like with Ephesus, we see brethren who are willing to stand up for the truth, to not deny the name of Jesus in the face of persecution, but there are some issues. Verse 14, I have a few things against whom? Against you. Okay, now to whom is Jesus writing? He's writing to these faithful brethren. He says, I have a few things against you. Why? Because you have there those who hold to the doctrine or hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexuality. Then in verse 15, he says, thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Then he says in verse 16, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Now, it's interesting that you've got a divided church here in Pergamos. Okay, you have faithful brethren. Then you've got some who are holding the doctrine to the doctrine of Balaam, which we'll talk about in a second. You've got some who hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and there may have been some overlap between those two as well. But regardless, Jesus doesn't say, I have a few things against some of you, or, or some of you among some among you. He says, because you have, you have, they are those who hold to. I want to emphasize the fact that when Jesus offers this, he says, 
that this is something that, that he is addressing with the church there. It's, he's not addressing those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam or those who hold to the doctrine of Nicolaitans. He's not addressing them. He's addressing the brethren, the faithful brethren who are there. This is what I have against you because you allow brethren, first of all, to hold to the doctrine of Balaam. Now, the doctrine of Balaam, and we can go all through the, the kind of the, the past, the history of Balaam with Numbers 22 and 23. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, Peter says that he loved the wages of unrighteousness. Jude, verse 11, tells us that he was greedy for money. Okay? And, and, of course, we've looked at Balaam in past, uh, Balaam and Balak in past uh, character studies and kind of noted some of the, the goings on there with, with Balaam and how that even though when we go back to Numbers 22 and 23, we're not told what Balaam ended up doing, we find out later. But Balaam, kind of as a loophole, or an effort to loophole, attempt to loophole, the fact that God would not let Balaam curse the children of Israel. Like he literally would not let Balaam do it. Balaam wanted to, but he couldn't. So in an effort to get around that, what he did was he told Balak, okay, Balak, I can't curse the people for you, but here's how you can get God to curse the people, his own people. And so he taught Balak to be able to tempt and to entice the children of Israel ultimately to serve idols. Now, the doctrine of Balaam obviously has to have some connection with idolatry. The fact that Jesus specifically brings out uh, to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit sexual immorality, whether or not those are the only two aspects in which those who held to the doctrine of Balaam that, that maybe they were involved in eating things sacrificed to idols or committing sexual immorality, I don't believe it was limited to that. I think Jesus is bringing that up to recognize here's what the doctrine of Balaam entailed. What do you think? For instance, we talked about Smyrna. Remember how we talked about the, the synagogue of the Jews that Jesus says they're not really the synagogue of the Jews. They're the synagogue of Satan. Remember we talked about the possibility that the Jews there may have actually gone through with the offering of their pinch of incense. Because remember we talked about how the fact that the Jews ultimately were very much involved in getting the Christians in trouble for not offering their incense to Caesar. Maybe the Jews were willing to do that. Maybe they were able to pass it off in their mind as, but we don't really mean it. We're just offering it because it's the law of the land and we have to. But we don't really mean it. Well, I wonder if there were some in Pergamos, some brethren in Pergamos who had justified in their mind the kind of appeasing of the society in order to kind of get along with everybody and not to face persecution. Maybe they were willing to yield to some of the rituals and some of the, uh, the I don't know, aspects of idolatry just in an effort. Oh, I don't really believe what I'm doing when I offer this offering to, to Zeus. I don't really believe in this. But you know what? Because our society, this is something they want of us. We're going to go through the motions of it, even though we don't really mean it. And this is something to think about. Because those who held to the doctrine of Balaam, they put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. It makes me wonder if these, some of these brethren who held to this were not only were they had they stumbled at this, but maybe they were trying to throw a stumbling block in the way of the rest of the brethren. You could just go, you don't have to be persecuted. Why die when you can just appease everybody and you don't have to actually believe it. Just do it, go through the motions, and then we can get back to worshiping Jehovah. Just something to think about, and we'll pick up here next Wednesday night. Thank you, everybody.